Uh, good afternoon to members of the Mac Manage Management Committee. The meeting is now called to order. <clears throat> For those around the table, please turn on your microphone when speaking. For those participating via Zoom, please state your name when making a comment or asking a question. The MAG public comment process allows members of the public to comment on items on today's agenda or on items that fall under MAG's jurisdiction. <clears throat> if you'd like to comment at today's meeting, please fill out a request to speak card located on the information table in the hallway and give it to MAG staff. If you parked in the garage, parking validators are, are available on the information table in the hallway. If you purchase a transit ticket to come to the meeting, please see staff for a ticket. Hearing assisted devices are available from MAG staff. We'll now begin the meeting with a roll call of all members. MAG staff, will you conduct that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, I will go down the list alphabetically. Please unmute and indicate that you are present. Patrick Banger? Present. Thank you. Present. Jeffrey Hartman? Jean Blackman? Here. Thank you. Chair Christopher Brady? Present. Thank you. Andrew Ching? Ron Corbin? Present. Thank you. Dan Cotterman? Here. Thank you. Henry Darwin? Present. Thank you. Philip Dorchester? Crystal Dykes? Present. Thank you. Carrie Dyrick? Stephen Erno? Here. Thank you. Bruce Gardner? Present. Thank you. Rachel Goodwin? Present. Thank you. Ben Bitter is proxy for Rick Horst. Suzanne Jones. Present. Thank you. Jill Kymack. Jeff Kulaga. Present. Thank you. Leah Liu. Russ Martin. Reyes Medrano. Alexis Tamarin Kinsey as proxy for Jessica Mefford Miller. Present. Thank you. Jennifer Jack as proxy for Brian Myers. Present. Thank you. Gary Neese. Kevin Phelps. Here. Thank you. Jen Pekorski. Matt Busby as proxy for Bryant Powell. Here. Thank you. Wynette Reed. Present. Thank you. Dale Wiebush as proxy for Jim Thompson. Present. Thank you. Jennifer Tolf. Here. Thank you. Kathy Valenzuela. Here. Thank you. Matthew Williams. Tracy Montgomery as proxy for Bob Wingenroth. Here. Thank you. Tad Willie as proxy for Joshua Wright. Present. Thank you. Is there anyone that I missed? Mr. Chair, we have quorum. Thank you. If you all join me uh, to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Let's see, before we begin, we have a few members to recognize. Maybe we'll do Jen, it's not on right now, right? With the county, I didn't secure Cor her. Correct, she was not okay. able to So join. maybe you'll put that on the next time we meet and we can Very recognize good. her then, okay. Uh, I, well, it does say that she's gonna be late. Uh, well, let me just mention Jen Korski is the new county manager for Maricopa County. She may be joining us a little bit later. Uh, we would like to thank Joy Rich for her service to MAG, to Maricopa County, and to the region for all her years of service. Uh, so thank you to Joy, and we wish her all the best in her future endeavors. Also like to welcome, uh, is Suzanne Jones, the community manager of Gila River Indian Community, was she with us? Is she with us? Okay, I'd like to welcome her. Russ Martin, town manager for Florence. Rachel Goodwin, as interim town manager for Fountain Hills. I want to thank Grady Miller, Lisa Gar Garcia, and Kate. Kathleen Curley 
for serving on the MAG committee, MAG management committee, and for your service to the region over the years. All right, our next item is called to the audience. This is an opportunity for the public to comment on items that fall under MAG's jurisdiction that are not on the agenda or that are on the agenda for discussion and not for action. Uh, 15 minutes will be provided for the call to the audience agenda item unless the committee requests an exception. So I just have the one card, is that correct? <clears throat> for the request to speak and call the audience. Um, MAG also provides opportunity for members of the public to submit written comments via the website one hour prior to the meetings. Um, so we have one comment, Diane Barker. Diane, if you'll please step forward. And you can hear me. All right. And uh, MAG managers and our new director on his job, Ed Zerker and staff. Um, I'm interested, as I believe MAG is, in two fundamental necessities, water and air. And in that vein, you're hearing quite a bit about water. And, you know, some stories are like, oh my gosh, you know, this is a threat. We're in a threat drought and so forth. But then we're also jumping up in the fact that we had a lot of snowpack and it is double the amount this year than we've had in years. And so some people say, wow, we're really, but if you read further, because of pumping from groundwater, you know, we need to have like maybe six years of this in the future. But, you know, I want to read from you on this is called Arizona has like an under 100 year plan. And maybe unlike some states, we have been planning for water a whole lot. We lead the nation in rigorous water conservation. Uh, we had an act in 1980 called the Groundwater Management Act. I understand that actually Arizona gets maybe almost 40%, you know, from groundwater. And um, there are areas that where they did wildcat subdivision. And so we've had to, you know, us up in Scottsdale had to haul water. Well, we don't want more of that. So we have to have the stricter zoning laws to preserve. And I think that probably a lot of you know things that I don't even know about this uh, groundwater, but I think that it's something that should concern us all. I carry water with me. I do well in the warm climate and I'm out there and I find people that are, you know, they don't know that they need to stay hydrated. So in your governments, it's good to start putting out those flyers about staying hydrated because you know, that's, it's really health risk. And then the other agenda item on the air quality, and they moved that, and I was glad because that was, it said it was for action, but it's just discussion today, and it has to do with ozone. And folks, the thing about it that we don't really talk about that much is, you know, half of this is coming from on road. It comes from oil-based vehicles. And at one time we had in the state where it was don't drive one day per year license. We need to have leaders that would do that and find alternative transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. All right, we'll move to item number four, <clears throat> executive director's report. So we'll head, hear from our executive, managing executive director, Ed Zerker. Ed? <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Let's see if I can do this here. Uh, I think we've talked before, but the region was awarded a SMART grant um, that was part of a, a application jointly with ADOT. And I believe that the, uh, the uh, Commerce Authority was also part of that. So it's a, it's a good collaboration and something we wanna be, be more of. Next slide. I wanna recognize uh, our outgoing executive director, Eric Anderson, who's joining us on the phone but he did receive the Transit Champion Award from the Arizona Transit Association. There's probably a time in this region where a MAG director receiving a transit award would have been like you know, hell freezing over, but <laughs> I think it's a great uh, indication of the work Eric has done and that the organization has done in the past 20 plus years to really bring transit uh, 
be be multimodal in what mag is about and so congratulations to eric very well well deserved many of you were there it was nice that dennis smith and roger herzog and ken driggs and some other folks were there director toe thank you for uh being also part of that uh the transit association slash a dot conference to be to be formal so thanks that's another thing that that's a nice uh, change in the region is that a dot is a full partner in transit too and so we really appreciate that uh we talked last time, but this actually happened that MAG was recognized by the Women in, uh, women in Transportation Seminar for uh, championing women in transportation. We have a strong group of engineers and employees in MAG who work in transportation. So that was a nice recognition of the entire uh, group. Eric accepted the award on behalf of the agency at that as a recognition of some efforts to uh, diversify the, the staffing, staffing at MAG. I think that that is it. I would just a couple things. I would say thank you to all of you for your welcome to me in the last six weeks as I've started. I am trying to get out over the next several months to visit with your mayors and hopefully you all at the same time. Sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. But just to get out to your community, I was in Peoria, I've been, been to Glendale, I've been able to, to get around, spoke to, to the town uh, council at Fountain Hills. So where there are those opportunities, I really want to take that to visit. Uh, with you all and uh, in your town. Just one other thing, I, I get to go to both East and West Valley managers, and I've noticed something that's a common theme in both, which is sober living homes. Uh, so at West Valley yesterday, this is for the East Valley folks, there was conversation about that. And I think that uh, if you have some issues, connect with Renee Gill Gillian at uh, the League of Cities and Towns. They kind of asked him yesterday for the league to take the lead on doing some work. I know I've heard it from Surprise uh, from others in the East Valley. So I think there's some collective work to be done. Connect with the League of Cities and Towns on that if, if you're having issues and they're trying to bring folks together on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ed. All right, we'll now proceed to the uh, consent agenda. Our next item is approval of the consent agenda. Items 5A through 5J are on the consent agenda. Does any member of the committee have questions, requests, or request a presentation on any of these items? All right, prior to, prior to the approval of the consent and agenda, do we have any members of the public who wish to comment on any of the consent agenda items? No, okay. Um, we don't have any written comments, I'm assuming either? That is correct. Mr. Chair, we don't have any written comments for today's agenda. All right, thank you. All right, so will you, is there a motion to approve consent items 5A through 5J? So moved. We have a motion by Dan Cotterman. Do we have a second? Second. Oh, okay. We have a motion and a second. Uh, can I have a voice vote for those in the room? Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. And staff will take a roll call of the members participating virtually. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you confirm this second? Read. Thank you. I will go down the list of members participating virtually. Please unmute and indicate how you vote. Jean Blackman. Jean Blackman. Ron Corbin. Yes. Thank you. Crystal Dykes. Yes. Thank you. Oh. Stephen Erno. Yes. Thank you. Suzanne Jones? Yes. Thank you. Jeff Kulaga? Yes. Thank you. Alexis Tamarin Kinsey? Yes. Thank you. Kevin Phelps? Here. Thank you. Matt Busby? Aye. Thank you. Kathy Valenzuela? Yes. Thank you. And checking back with Jean Blackman. Mr. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. We'll now uh, move to item six. So item six is a draft of suggested list of measures to reduce ozone in the Maricopa non-attainment area. This draft of measures will be presented to us and regional council later this year for approval. For now, though, we are going to hear an informational report on air quality and have a discussion on the air quality issues as a management committee uh, without action. 
MAF, MAG staff will take the feedback into account as they develop recommendations for future action. This item is on the agenda for information and discussion and will be presented by the MAG environmental director, Tim Franquist. All right, Tim. Great. Thank you, Chairman and, and members of the Management Committee. I appreciate the opportunity today to kind of unpack this ozone uh, challenge. So I'll jump right into it here. So I want to start kind of with the bottom line. So if we take away anything today, we need to kind of take away four different things. One, that our area is on a fast track to be categorized as serious non-attainment. Two, that ozone is a public health issue and it negatively impacts our economy. Three, that the roadway and transit projects are a critical element to meeting our attainment and our air quality plan. And then four, we need to have meaningful measures to reduce our ozone quickly in order to uh, stop any kind of federal intervention. And so real quick, I'll tap on that. So what does that look like? If we submit an air quality plan that doesn't show attainment, uh, that would trigger an immediate transportation conformity freeze. And if we do nothing and submit no plan in 24 months, the EPA would file what they call a federal implementation plan and kind of pick our measures for us. So action at some point here quickly will be required. So let me get into a little bit of the background. So in the blue area, what we can see here is MAG's planning area. It's a very, very large planning area. And what we see outlined here is the actual non-attainment area for ozone. This area is just slightly smaller than the state of Connecticut. Um, this is a significant issue because in the West, our counties are the size of states, our non-attainment areas are the size of states. We're back East, those counties are much, much smaller, which means the scope, the economic activity, the amount of sources is much smaller. So let's start with how ozone's formed. So ozone is formed in, in two different ways. And so we have first volatile organic compounds. Um, those are formed either through trees or plants, uh, solvents, paints, and wildfires. That has to be in combination with oxides and nitrogen. Which those are usually from vehicles, trucks, cars, and then our, our normal industrial sources. That has to be done in the presence of sunlight, so UV radiation. So that's a key here in the valley. Of course, we get a lot of that, 330 days of sunlight, and that together forms ozone. So it's considered what they call a secondary pollutant. So carbon monoxide comes out of your tailpipe that comes out as carbon dioxide. Ozone requires both VOCs and NOx in the presence of sunlight to actually create this. And again, we have plenty of that here in the valley. Again, this is a public health issue. And I think sometimes when we get talking a lot about the economic impacts, this gets underscored. But I think it's important for us to kind of just take a pause back to say, hey, this is an issue with our lungs. Uh, so ozone can cause issues with breathing. Uh, it can cause asthma or exacerbate asthma and um, emphysema. It can exacerbate um, asthma attacks. And then again, on those days that you may, as a healthy adult may feel watery eyes, kind of burning or scratchy throats um, or inflamed lungs. Uh, again, this is ozone doing that. I think one of the things that I think scares me the most today is too, it can make us more susceptible to other lung diseases. And with the emergence of things like COVID, I think this is actually even a growing concern among our population. So where are we at today? So we have a current standard of the 70 parts per billion. Um, and the way they categorize this, it started off at marginal. In the today, we're at moderate, and that happened back in October of 2012. In 2021, we measured concentrations. Uh, the high end here is this 80. Uh, this is the air that we were exposed to. So in terms of the, the public health impact, this is the air that we're breathing. We are allowed to exclude things like wildfire, which is referred to as exceptional events. Um, with that removal, we were at somewhere around 75 in 2021. In 2022, that number increases. We're breathing around 81 parts per billion of ozone. And we remove the wildfires, we're at about 77. So again, we're trending, unfortunately, in the wrong direction. So back to kind of where we get classified. So the best and obvious uh, place for us to be is that we're attaining the standard that's best for public health, that's best for economy. But when that doesn't happen and we don't meet the standard, we're typically slotted in marginal non-attainment. And we get three years to attain that standard. You don't typically hear too much about this. There's not a lot of regulatory programs required, but it does initiate a new air quality program called um, New Source Review, and it requires emission offsets. So that can be problematic, typically impacts big sources. So again, we don't hear too, too much about that. What we're having the discussion today is we're at moderate. Again, we have another three years to attain this standard. You can see here that 2024, we need to attain this standard. But now we actually have to start talking about actual regulatory measures to bring down our ozone. Those emission offsets required for those permits, they actually increase as well. And I think I really just want to emphasize this point. So this is a critical, critical time for our discussions. This break point between moderate and serious is very significant. Uh, when we talk about emission offsets, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. That threshold where they're required gets chopped in half between moderate and serious. 
additional regulatory programs have to come in place to actually reduce our ozone. So this is kind of an escalating ladder, more and more regulatory measures until we meet the standard. Again, we get three years to meet that standard. If that doesn't happen, we get into severe. This is a lot where California is today. So a lot of those California measures kind of set the baseline for where we're at. And then if we don't meet that standard, then we're going to, again, we get buffed up to extreme. So where does this all kind of center around? So it's important to note that this is all driven by the Clean Air Act. Um, the EPA is the one who actually sets these air quality standards. They get a chance to do this every five years. Um, those standards typically come down. When we talk about submitting our air quality plans, it is ultimately the EPA that approves those plans, uh, and then they can enforce those plans. So the different programs that we talk about putting in those plans, once they approve them, they become federally enforceable. Um, so if we talk about removing things like trip reduction, that becomes very, very problematic, and those plans are, are subject to potential disapproval at that point. What we do here at MAG is we actually amalgamate all these different programs into what's referred to as a state implementation plan. We make sure those measures actually show compliance with the standard, and then we submit that to the EPA. Now, part of that, we work with our partners at Maricopa County and Pinal County. We have to have those measures memorialized in law. Um, so the counties will write those laws and then enforce those laws, as does the state of Arizona for things that are in their jurisdiction, and then they ultimately adopt the state implementation plan. So again, kind of a tap back to where we are in terms of standards. So again, every five years, the US EPA by law has to look at each of these air quality standards. And you can see over time that they typically come down to 1997, 2008, and then 2015. So where do we kind of trend? Well, we were trending in a really, really good direction there for, for many years. We had the dip out there, the recession uh, dropped some of our emissions. We had some really favorable weather around that time. Uh, but I think what's really concerning is that we start to see this uptick in just a few years ago. Um, the blue line, again, that represents um, the air that we're breathing, the air that we're exposed to. The light blue line, or excuse me, the light green line, that's with wildfires removed, those exceptional events. And again, I think what's alarming here is we actually see both those lines are upticking, not, not the trend that we would expect to see over time. And so where does that actually put us in the day? So with a 70 parts per billion standard, we're looking at being somewhere around 77 parts per billion. This is kind of a Grand, Le Grand Canyon level cliff from where we're at to where we need to be. So again, just in terms of additional trends. So this is um, Maricopa County monitors, again, showing that we're just not trending in the right direction. Uh, the light green line here is uh, Pinell County. This is a, a monitor associated with the urban portion of Pinell County. Again, what we can see is we're simply just not trending in the right direction. So is this just an area issue downtown? Is this an area-wide issue? What you can see here in the orange dots are the area-wide monitors for the area. And so we have an extensive monitoring network in, in the uh, region, um, and all of them are showing non-attainment to some extent. So this is not just a downtown Phoenix or Mesa or Tempe issue. Unfortunately, what this is is a uh, regional ozone problem. So how have we addressed this issue in the past? Well, in the today, we have over 90 different control measures that have been working really, really well. And you can see from the graph earlier that we were bringing ozone down. And those measures look like things that we're aware of, um, vehicle emission testing, our tailpipe, federal tailpipe standards, major controls on industry, uh, coordinated traffic signals, uh, clean burning fuels. With over 90 measures on the books today, as you can see, we're actually starting to trend in the wrong direction. So what does this mean in terms of deadlines? So again, this is why I think today we really are having this conversation with a sense of a real urgency. So our deadline for this moderate non-attainment is 2024. However, the EPA is gonna look at data this summer for summer 2023 to, to see if we've actually attained the standard. So because the deadline's in the middle of the summer of next year, unfortunately we tend to lose a year under this situation. So when we talk about a sense of urgency and need to re reduce ozone today, it really is something that we need to think about in very short order. If we can't do that by the deadline in 2024, this is the threshold I was talking about. This is where the conversation really begins because it starts to impact most businesses in our area. And that's under serious non-attainment. We have to 2027 to do that. So again, any measures that we put in place today, even if we can't make that 2024 standard, is really critical because the faster we can get back into attainment is going to be better for public health and our economy. Uh, for whatever reason, we don't get into attainment by 2027. Again, this is a critical break point again for California level control. So again, nothing to throw our neighbors under the bus, but one of the reasons we hear so much about California, they, they are in the serious to severe um, extreme category. They set the baseline for a lot of these control measures. And so when you begin to look at these plans, you have to begin to look at California level controls, unfortunately. So let me switch gears again. How does this actually impact business? So we're gonna do kind of a permitting 101, I apologize. 
So when a, a new business comes into the area or they want to expand in a non-attainment area, and they're a new major source, and we'll talk about kind of what those thresholds are, or they want to make an expansion. So again, for our growing economy, this is really important. They have to get something what's called an emission offset. So let's use 100 tons per year. If they're a 100 ton per year uh, polluter, they have to find 115 tons to offset. And they can do that a couple of different ways. They can go to the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality's emission bank. And so if a company has done some kind of emission control project that's actually dropped their emissions, they can actually bank those emissions and sell those. Or if a company actually goes, goes out of business, they can actually bank those credits and sell those as well. There's a couple other complicated ways to do that, but this is traditionally how it's done. The company may have done those control projects in-house and have that emission um, surplus that they can use internally so they don't have to put them in the emissions bank and they can use those to make those expansions in the area. We have to find those emission offsets, get an air quality permit before that business can even begin to operate. And you can see probably just even going through these slides, it, it's, it's a laborious process and it takes a good amount of time before we can get that business actually up and going. So what is that, what is, how does this make this so difficult? So in the today, the threshold for these offsets in this permitting regime is 100 tons per year. So for our area, that's a, that's a pretty big company. That's, that's a, a power plant size company. It's a microchip size company. So again, we don't hear too, too much about it um, until we start to get to this, this next threshold. Under Sirius, what you can see is that threshold gets chopped in half. And so now we're not talking about power plants. We're not talking about major microchip manufacturers. We're actually talking about more run of the mill, hot mix asphalt plants, coating operations, things kind of the core of our economic uh, development size companies. And again, if we don't make our attainment, we go to severe, you can see it gets chopped in half again, making that economic development even that much more difficult and extreme would almost next be impossible. So again, let me give a real world example. So how's this working out in the world today? So in the today, serious non-attainment uh, area, if, if we were serious, would be a 50 ton per year threshold. I think most folks are uh, very familiar with the TSMC. They're in the today permitted or be permitted at 90 tons per year to escape that 100 year 100 ton threshold so they don't have to get subject to this in 2024 if that facility is not permanent built they're going to be subject to the emission offsets they're going to have to find 108 tons of offsets before they can even be get get up and running data centers that was something real big here in the area i think it's beginning to slow down but again another core portion of our portfolio here 50 tons per year it's a relatively mid-sized company they would have to find 60 tons per year after 2024 it's very unlikely that these facilities could locate in the region. It's not that they don't come to Arizona, but it would be very, very difficult for them to come into our region. So let's talk about why. So we talked about how we generate offsets. The real serious issue with why these air companies could not come to the area is there's simply no emission offsets to be had. So unlike California or Texas, which are major heavy industry areas, they generate these offsets just by the nature of their economy. We simply don't have that. Uh, here and so this is why we've been talking a lot with GPAC, the Arizona Chamber of Commerce, a lot with our business partners because without these offsets, you simply cannot permit in the in the non-attainment area. So things to kind of remember. So only today, into today, mainly it's large businesses that are impacted. When we move into serious, that's going to impact most businesses. Emission offsets continue to escalate as we go up that classification ladder. And unfortunately, there are no emission offsets in the today to be had to give out those to any new or expanding businesses, which will obviously affect any new companies that want to come in the area or any expanding companies in the today. So what's next coming down the road? So where, where does ozone actually come from? So this is a monitor from downtown Phoenix. Um, what you can see is a lot of our ozone, unfortunately, comes from somewhere else. So from another state, internationally, from outside our non-attainment area. Unfortunately, for how it works at a local control level, we can only deal with these different source categories. So local vehicles, uh, off-road vehicles, so our construction equipment that we see out there, generators. Um, in a very small subset there, we see uh, industrial sources. So again, very, very small subset of sources we get to work with in terms of how we control this ozone. So is that just a downtown Phoenix issue? Again, I think the important note here is it's not just a downtown urban issue. We can see as a monitor all the way out here at Tonto uh, National Monument, it's also showing non-attainment Again, most of the ozone coming from outside the area, but you can see that subset is still pretty small. But at the end of the day, we have a regional wide ozone challenge ahead of us. So in terms of what's out there, we'll, we're gonna to have to be talking about new control measures. It's a lot of what we came here to talk about today is what does that mix look like? And this is where I think the Prop 400 extension comes in. 
we know in the today that the Prop 400 extension gives us significant air quality benefits just by the nature of it. In terms of, we've modeled the vehicle emission testing program that I think most folks are aware of. The air quality uh, implications of the Prop 400E are equivalent to that size of a regulatory program. Without that kind of program in place, we have to find another regulatory program to supplement what we would get out of the transit portion. And then we still have that seven parts per billion delta that we got to we got to find additional regulatory programs. So again, I think it's really important as we have that discussion, we do get air quality benefits from the Prop 400 extension projects. Otherwise we have to, fig we have to figure out another regulatory program upon many other regulatory programs that we'll have to consider. So again, what, is those, what does that mix of portfolio look like? Again, these are the, the air quality projects that go along and the benefits that we get as part of Prop 400 extension. You see it's numerous, they're, they're pretty extensive. Um, it's really important, I think, again, that we get the word out that those programs are not just good for society. It's not good for just moving people around, but we actually get real world air quality benefits from them. Um, again, in terms of bus routes that are at risk, um, I think that's something that concerned me when I saw this presentation on the Prop 400. Again, when folks are not on a bus, they're going to have to find some other kind of vehicle to get in that typically increases air, uh, air pollutants. And in a region that we're already struggling with ozone, we really need to do everything we can to drive that down. So again, this helps us supplement other additional regulatory programs and pretty significant size regulatory programs. So what do those new programs look like? And so this is just kind of a scatter shot. There's about 108 of uh, those programs. We've been working with a lot of your guys' as technical staff to vet those. You know, we're not advocating for any one or all of these. It's just a menu of options to start the conversation. But what those look like is eliminating vehicle uh, idling, uh, tailpipe emissions, diesel retrofits, alternative fuel fleet changeovers. So from some kind of fossil fuel to EV, uh, composting rules, low emission stoves. Let me highlight this. This is not a, a low. This is not a ban on stoves. This is just a low emission gas stove. Uh, a ban on gas lawnmowers, uh, leaking hose uh, from gas stations, uh, and additional controls on power plants, and then things like car phase three or other different fuel mixtures. Unfortunately, what you can see is this does target certain specific areas: uh, trucking, construction. Um, power plants um, and fleet owners um, tend, tends to be kind of where we see the core of these programs centered around. So how, what does this cost in the area? And I think this is another real important slide. So when we're in marginal, again, it, it's, it's a few million dollars. We don't hear too, too much about it. We get bumped up into this moderate category. So this is a study that we have scaled at the state uh, to look at our kind of local economy uh, that was done in kind of Texas. So you can see when we're in moderate, we expect about $107 million a year in actual impacts to our local economy. If we go to serious, that actually doubles. We would expect $250 million a year in local impacts. And again, you can see that number rises significantly for every year that we're in a different uh, classification. So here's some more updated studies. So th that one was from a few years ago. This was done in 2022 in Corpus Christi. Um, again, it got an economy nowhere near the size of the Phoenix metropolitan area. They're estimating that it impacts their local economy somewhere between $600 million to almost over a billion. Oklahoma City, the same thing. We see it uh, when you do that division out there between the 20 and 30 years, you're looking at several hundred million dollars per year, again, in an economy that's nowhere near the size of um, our region. So how are those costs actually um, calculated? So one is like we talked about, there's emission offsets. They're not free. They do have to get purchased. Uh, really stringent pollution control devices that's required for new facilities that move into the non-attainment area. One thing I think that's really important for us to note, one way a company may find a way to get their emission levels down is not to install very expensive pollution controls, but what they may do is go from three shifts to two shifts or two shifts to one shift. And when they do that, they actually produce less, which means they sell less, which means it drives down tax revenues in our area. So something that would actually impact um, most of the folks probably in this room. Other um, costs that go into it is missed business opportunities. We know that in talking with GPAC, that water right now and ozone offset credits are two of the biggest things that most new businesses are asking about. If they can't find those, they simply move on to an area um, that may have those resources available. So what's our strategy here? So first and foremost, have this discussion. What can we do in our area to actually reduce emissions as quickly as possible? Second is we do have an option, as we talked about earlier, a lot of our ozone comes from somewhere else. Some of those emissions are from international sources. The Clean Air Act does give us an opportunity to make an international transport demonstration. This is a very, very difficult demonstration, something the EPA is very highly discouraged, but it isn't allowed under the Clean Air Act. So it is something we will continue to look at. 
And then third, to work with our federal partners on what can we do to get some congressional relief from the Clean Air Act on some of this background ozone. Again, it's a very difficult conversation for us to be having that most of our ozone comes from somewhere else, and yet we still have to control this locally. So again, in terms of what's out there for you guys to, to contemplate in terms of control measures, these, these the scatter shot of the different control measures, I think it's important to give the target. So, so this 50% reduction, we talked about these, what's referred to as precursors, uh, oxides and nitrogen, volatile organic compounds, this 50% reduction is no small number. Um, you can see it's almost the size of a facility itself every single day, all year long. So it's a pretty big target that we have ahead of us. Um, so again, we're gonna have to find the control measures you know, quickly to help us get into compliance. So in terms of what's coming down the road, how does this process work? So as we work through this process and get this list uh, winnowed down to what we find acceptable in the area, we will send out commitment packets to the state, the county, to your municipalities, and asking what can uh, areas and entities commit to. Um, the state will have theirs, the county will have theirs, and of course the municipalities will have theirs. We'll take that back, model it to find out, have we chopped that uh, seven parts per million down to where we need to? continue that process in, until we get down to a uh, plan that shows compliance. Once we get there, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll calculate these emissions, make sure we're, we can submit a plan that does show compliance. Again, I think it's important to note, we have to submit a plan that shows compliance or it gets disapproved, that slams us into an immediate transportation conformity freeze. And if we do nothing, then 24 months, the federal government will issue a federal implementation plan and they will actually pick those measures off that list that we saw earlier. Again, we'll develop that plan, submit that plan, and then we'll begin to obviously implement those control measures. So kind of a, a touchback, again, air quality is important, obviously for public health reasons, for our economy. Uh, the Proposition 400, again, is not just a transportation project. Those transit projects do give us real world air quality benefits. We strongly believe that if we can put those two together, we can continue this economic growth that we're experiencing today in a very, very successful way. So again, I think it's just the word to get out is that these two combine, these two actually support each other or without each other, we both have challenges both in the Prop 400 and in the air quality field. And so again, just to tap back to that bottom line. So where does all get us back to? We're really, really looking at a serious non-attainment status in, in pretty short order. We do have a public health issue in terms of ozone and an impact to our public, or excuse me, our economy. Uh, these roadway projects are a huge uh, part of our strategy to attain this standard. And again, we do need to figure out this pretty quickly to keep the federal government in San Francisco. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. All right, any questions for Tim? Yes, go ahead. Just one question I realize. Sorry about that. I realize you very well might not know the answer to this question. So I saw a lot of information in there about the impacts this will have on future business. But maybe I missed it. I didn't see the cost to implement all these changes. Reading through these, I mean, it's, it's a lot of them is based on what California has done. And a lot of the changes, there's no cost estimated to do these. Do we have any idea what it would cost to implement all these changes? I understand we don't lose future development. I'm with you there. But any clue what it will cost to implement all these changes? Ballpark. Uh, Chairman, members of the management committee, we don't have a, a full understanding. We, we try to um, have the contractor put in there the cost of implementing these measures when that information was available. But until we actually have the list to know we are going to select X, Y, and Z measures, we won't necessarily have that number. Um, but I think we can get a good ballpark once we know what that is. Yeah, um, you just, would you just flip back to the slides? You had some costs. Again, ballpark. If we we're Corpus Christi, somebody estimated between six hundred million and one point seven billion. If we were Oklahoma City. There was a number. It's expensive. Yeah. But that's, that's the, but this is that's approximation. Loss, right? What's that? That's economic loss. No. I don't, is that economic loss? It's economic loss. Okay, yeah. then go to the one. You had the other uh, chart where you showed. There you go. That's economic loss, though, too, right? No. What would it cost us to implement the changes we're looking at, though? But we, we don't know, do we? I don't think we have a great understanding, but I think it's safe to say that it's, it's probably a good portion of this is the emission control measures that go into it. Because you can see, look at the slide here. Of course, it does, we don't get percentage. We don't percentize what that is, but the, the permitting and the control measures that go in place, that's that's a substantial portion of that. Okay. But, I'm just curious. Thank you for your presentation. Very informative. Yes, Dan. Thank you, sir. Do you have the ozone measurements during the pandemic when most people weren't driving to see what the impact of potentially wiping out 
that portion of the contribution? Do we know what that delta would look like based on that that time period? Chairman, uh, members of management, yeah, let me kind of scan back here. We do, and what was shocking, and this is a great question because it, it, most folks would expect that our, our mission levels plummeted, but they didn't. Uh, because I think one of the pieces is we do have international transport during portion of the year when we have our local emissions. I don't know if we can bump back Tyler. And I guess the point back. of my question is, what impact could we reasonably expect to see if we start electrifying fleets or looking at alternative fuel vehicles? Is it really going to move the needle? That seems like a unique period of time where we can kind of measure what would happen in that scenario. Chairman. Yeah. It didn't go down like I think, part, I think part of that reason is we still needed goods and services. And so whether we were driving to work or somebody was bringing something to our house or we're going to a Lowe's to pick up a, and you know, we're sitting there idling in the summertime. Idling is actually um, a lot more polluting to the atmosphere than us moving around. So again, when we talk about Prop 400, that those congestion mitigation projects are really important, not for just safety reasons, but a car that's moving it's onboard emission controls are working a lot better. So I think we saw a lot of folks sitting around waiting for different food stuffs. And again, those big trucks, I don't know how you guys were experiencing, but I watched, you know, my, my local Amazon driver, nothing against Amazon, but I had a little call sack and come to my house, stop, keep the truck running, take off again, move to the next house. Every time they fire that truck up, it's kind of a cold start. And so I think, again, just speculating because we don't know exactly, but I think, again, we just saw a lot of uh, new, new trucking, a lot of idling during that period. But again, we're still trying. Yeah. To and this that. this also doesn't take into account population growth because think what population has done from the left edge of this chart, even during the Great Recession when it was arguably dropping here, but population growth plays into that as well. Yeah, but yeah, good question. Sure. One, one follow-up question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, when you mentioned data centers, are they are data centers being sort of deemed for the pollution from the power generated to support them? So it's like an indirect. It's not them that's directly polluting, but it's the power generation. Did I get that right, um, Chairman? Members of management, it's actually they run emergency generators. Um, okay. So they're and they're massive generators, and so believe it or not, they're so big that they only run them just just to make sure that they work. But they're so big, they're actually um, emitting those pollutants directly from just those emergency um, trial runs. Thank you. And also go back to something Dan said and something we all know from water, right? There's paper water and there's water water. I think, and Henry can probably talk to this, some of these things, they're modeled. So it's almost like a paper ozone reduction that you don't find out until later, the actual ozone reduction, but you got to demonstrate the paper ozone reduction through the measures. And Henry's the expert on M this. Mr. Chair, members of the, of the committee, just, just so you all know why Ed saying that. Uh, so you, you may not know a lot everything about my background, but I was the former director of Arizona DEQ. Tim at one point actually worked for me, um, but I was also number two number two at the Environmental Protection Agency for three years. Uh, so um, Ed and I were talking about this yesterday uh, and um, we, we are in, in a dire situation. And I, and, I, and I work for a mayor and council now where economic development is one of their top priorities. So I listen very closely when I hear GPEC say things like every or, or the Arizona Commerce Authority saying there's two things that every company looking at Arizona asks about. Number one is water. And we all know about that. We hear a lot about that almost every day about our water woes in the state of Arizona. We don't hear about, which is equally maybe even more so problematic for the Maricopa uh, region, uh, is, is ozone. Um, these are real world questions, real world impacts, because if they're coming in and they have emissions that are over um, 100 tons currently, they're just passing on on Maricopa County. They're, they're move, moving on to something else because there are no offsets to be had. So they they will not be able to get a permit in Maricopa County. Um, that's, that threshold is about to reduce from 100 tons to 50 tons. And as Tim rightfully pointed out, this is going to exclude even more economic development in Maricopa County uh, unless we figure out a solution. Um, and and not to go not to go too out into the future, but I think it's 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 important for us to start considering a dual track approach uh, for our region. Uh, first and foremost, we need to we need to we need to make um, reasonable progress. We need to make demonstration to EPA that we are treating this situation seriously. 
So we need to do things like, like Mag is suggesting about coming up with a list of options for us to consider in reducing ozone uh, in, in our region. In, a, in addition to that, and maybe equally as important, maybe, maybe even more important to that is that we need to start advocating for reasonableness from EPA. And what does reasonableness, reasonableness look like? It looks like giving us some exception or exclusion for those areas in which we have absolutely no control. Um, these are the, the 60 to 70% of our ozone issues are directly attributable to things that are beyond our control, that are outside of the Maricopa boundary. That's why you see regions in this, in Maricopa, the Maricopa area, but also throughout the state, there'll be a non-attainment that don't have a single source of ozone in their jurisdiction. Keep that, I mean, we think we have a problem. There are going to be jurisdictions in the state of Arizona that are out of compliance with the ozone standard and don't have a single stationary source of ozone in their jurisdiction. Uh, so uh, it, is, it is a problem that, that is, is somewhat unique to Arizona, but not an Arizona only problem. And I know that Ed was mentioning that he started to talk to his counterparts and other regions around the Southwest that have the similar problem. But we need to start talking to our congressional delegation. We need to start talking to EPA about treating us fairly uh, in their um, analysis of the plans that we must submit. Uh, and someone was, was talking about how the plans certainly have to be legitimate. They certainly have to be putting our best foot forward. They have to be approvable by EPA. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean those plans are going are gonna to allow us to achieve attainment. Um, it's very. It, it happens very commonly where EPA appro approves plans, and 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 those areas still don't reach attainment under those plans, and have to come up with new plans. So I get. So I won't speak. I won't speak anymore. I could probably speak for hours about this and bore you all to death. But I will say that taking a dual track approach would be my suggestion. And I'm saying this as a city manager who has a mayor and council who's one of their top priorities is economic development. So I'm monitoring this and I'm more than willing to do my part and advocating with EPA, uh, working with MAG and trying to put our best foot forward with letting EPA know that we're taking this seriously, but at the same time behind the scenes, advocating and working with them to be more reasonable in their approach uh, to, our, to our jurisdiction. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Patrick. Yeah, thank you, Henry. You know, in follow up to a, a comment Henry just made or, or noted, um, the information, you had a, a circle graph showing the breakdown of the ozone that is coming into this region from other areas and sources, and then what's generated within our region. Are those estimates or those actual measurements? And do we have any historical data on those to show is the ozone coming in from outside the region increasing? Uh, chairman, members of the uh, management committee, um, those are modeled. Um, so okay. they're, they're tight models, they're good models. Um, the, sadly, um, I was given this presentation in 2016, 17. This, this is still the case here in Arizona. We get a little shifting, a little changing, but historically this is has been the case for quite some time. And so 2018, I actually got the opportunity to testify in Congress on this exact issue of international transport, because it's been something that's been a challenge to the state of Arizona and certainly this region for quite some time. So. Yeah, I think this is a pretty fair representation of- So uh, those percentages are unchanged? <clears throat> correct, these are, these are more or less steady state. Can I, can I, ask mm -hmm. a, a, I think it's related to your question, mm -hmm. if I can, if you would mind, Mr. Mr. Chair. So I think I heard you at one point say, not in this presentation before Tim, say that if we eliminated cars and trucks completely from this, from this estimate, we'd still not meet, not meet it, the, the new standard, correct? Yeah, Chairman, members of the management, we would be very close to it, it would be, but, it would, but even if we limited every car and truck from the road, it would still be questionable whether or not we'd meet, we'd be able to meet the standard. Correct. Yeah. I'm going to put you like, I'm acting like you're on the standard like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when we looked I, at this, my intent. yeah. So we looked at this number, if you removed 4 million vehicles off the road, we might be in, in compliance with that standard. Right. So, you know, the, the point being is um, first, for my council, this is is new information. We're, we're doing several things on the list now, and we're certainly happy to commit to continue doing those, but it sounds like we need to do much more than we're currently doing. And I just question how much money we're gonna spend and if we're actually going to have any real impact because the majority of our problems is, is created elsewhere. And um, if we need to make commitments by August, we will certainly do everything we can, but I'm not sure what I'm get my council yeah. to go along with. Um, in just a handful of months. So that's a really important point. 
that uh, Henry's right about, and that's why the, the previous slide of the triangles on there is we really got to do a couple things. Uh, well, three. Uh, that's on right. number one. It's why we just keep pounding the drum on Prop 400 as proposed because it was modeled and it's in conformity. It helps the region advance the ball. So Prop 400 as proposed advances the ball in this area. The meeting, meeting the doing everything we can to meet the standards, even though they're more than difficult, beyond difficult, but you got to show motion and you got to show action and you've got to underlie it with conversations with other, with elected officials, policymakers, senior members of the EPA, senior members of the administration. And that's where Henry is helpful to us with, from his experience. Uh, but we got to do all those things at the same time. What's sort of troubled me is I've heard the conversation, not among the cities, but out in the world is some people want to just do only one thing. And often it's go punch EPA in the nose. Okay. I mean, that maybe it feels good, but it's not going to get us anywhere and they're not going to be inclined to, to work with us if that's all we're doing. We got we to gotta do it all. We got to advance the ball on all fronts to have any sort of, I think, realistic chance to get EPA to change their standards. And at the same time, we have to be mindful. It is a health standard. And so we're talking about public health. Um, and so we can never lose sight of that too. That it's not, none of us wants air that, that makes us sick. Uh, and no one's saying that, but sometimes that gets lost in, in our messaging too. So, yeah, and I'll just comment. I mean, I'm coming to these meetings for almost 18 years. The boundary condition has always been the issue, it's been a major issue. Fires in Mexico and the smoke coming across. We have tried to fight that. I'm, we've fought that battle over and over with EPA and tried to delineate that time, those time periods and what that would look like. I still think it's worth having the discussion. It is not a new conversation with the EPA. Uh, we try to get out of, you know, or try to modify the, the severity of um, our readings by using that argument. So it won't be new argument from us and it won't be something they've just heard. I'm not, I think we should still do it. I mean, we keep coming back to that. The one thing that um, I guess I would like to know a little bit more about, because it feels a little bit as we have this conversation here, which is appropriate, but at the same time, it feels like this is a very small audience of where this conversation needs to be had. And as you look at you know, the list of all the measures that are being recommended, um, there's a lot of other jurisdictions that are mentioned here, right? We, as MAG, um, there's just some things that we wouldn't have the jurisdiction to be able to regulate or whether, because it's probably more of a county issue or a statewide issue. So how, what's the, I mean, and then obviously there's some things that we as local governments can do. It seems like it would be helpful to delineate some of that, at least from the membership here, what can we do? But then Tim, you have these conversations. How, where's your conversation with the county and the state? Because they've got to be involved in it. And I'm assuming this is an important document or I'm sorry, report from them. So can you help me how do you bring those groups into the conversation? Uh, chairman, members of the management committee, it's a great question. Um, we've had extensive conversations, particularly with the county, um, since, since they have most of the jurisdiction here. Uh, we have been talking to the state, but they have the same kind of complications we're having on the Prop 400. Most of what they would do would have to be a statutory change. You can imagine the complications there, but same thing, we still have to have those discussions. Um, the implementing rules to this also say if we can't attain the standard here, we do have to have that conversation with the state to say you have to look outside that area. Again, that's complicated for a few different reasons. One, obviously politically and economically, but two, a lot of those sources outside the area uh, are heavily controlled in the today as well. And so again, you're, you're starting to squeeze you know, water from a rock. You still have to do it. Um, so we are having this conversation with the state, but the county has been, um, I think a lot more um, positive in that discussion. Because again, a lot of those composting rules um, they say we can get a lot of good efforts there. So they're going through that list to see it same, same as what we're doing and saying, okay, what is truly reasonable? Um, what can we do? Some of those would impact maybe municipalities because it would be countywide rules. Um, I know for you guys, fleets, that's not something easy to do. Um, some jurisdictions can look to do that. Others can't. Uh, we know that um, the city of Phoenix is looking at getting some refuge, EV refuse trucks. They won't get those trucks for a year just because of supply chain issues. So there is a big challenge out there, even for municipalities from a supply chain. But as we were saying, is we have to do something pretty quick. 
Um, so when we send out those commitment packets, we will tailor that to the municipalities. We're certainly not going to put on their fuel changes that wouldn't make any sense to a municipality sure. that's outside your So we continue to have those discussions. We've had multiple uh, stakeholder meetings. Uh, the county and the state, of course, have been there, as has the business community. So uh, I've done this presentation, you know, certainly here, but we've really been doing a lot of discussions and, and presentations to the business community as well, since they're going to be heavily impacted as well. And so, again, we're just trying to get that word out. We know of that 108 um, measure list. It just would be impossible and just not prudent for us to do everything on that list. So really, it's just trying to winnow that down to what is reasonable, what makes sense for a municipality, what makes sense for the state, what makes sense for the county. But if I were to kind of give a prioritization, the county is going to be by far and away the, the largest implementer by rule. State, we may get something out of there, but again, their complications are going to lie really in the legislature. And then municipalities, again, that's going to vary uh, based on budgets, based on uh, priorities. But again, we're just asking folks to look deep um, on that list because, again, we, we have to submit something. We need to make a good faith effort. Sure. And Sam, I think that would be wonderful because I, I was just trying to go through the list, right? I I was, you know, kind of, it was very difficult to try to sort through what I could do, a municipality could do, mm -hmm. and what you're going to do the county. So if you could help us maybe mm -hmm. the next time coming back around and kind of maybe begin sorting that out a little, and especially things you could see as low-hanging fruit for municipalities, because we need to have that conversation. If you're creating the urgency here, and then I think we need to continue to elevate this with the county, with the business community, because it can't just, you know, MAG's great as a resource, right? You're the great knowledge source and the great librarian of everything, but MAG doesn't regulate. MAG can't go out and, you know, establish the controls. You rely upon the members here to figure that out. So we've got to figure out how to take this and make sure the accountability, once you receive this information, there also has to be kind of this accountability what are you doing with it? So, uh, Chairman, members of the management, we'd be happy to do that. We can take that list and kind of begin to separate it out. So the next time we meet, you can right. see with much more clarity, okay, this is more municipality related. This is more state. We'll continue those conversations with the state and county. We may even have some information there um, in terms of rulemaking or areas that they've kind of went down the list. So, we'll, like I said, we'll make that a much more targeted list, list for you guys next time. Thank you. Dan, did you have something? I did. Oh, thank no. you. Uh, Great conversation, great information. I mean, it's bad information, but it, it's great to to hear it. Thank you. Uh, we're talking about controlling emissions, and I was thinking about uh, Matthew's question about the cost of doing those things. Is there any sort of industrial grade way of capturing the ozone from the atmosphere? Atmosphere, looking at it from a different perspective, I, and I don't know if that's possible or not. Um, Chairman, members of the uh, Mag Management Committee, are you talking about like an actual physical device that kind of scrubs the air? Correct. Is there technology that would remove it versus controlling emitting it? I'm not aware of like a mass system that we could sit, you know, downtown Phoenix or Mesa that you know kind of scrubs the air. Unfortunately, what you do is you do that at a facility. So through their pollution streams, when they're starting to emit, you have those different pollution control devices. So it's that's why we say it's a real impact to business because you have to stick it on. It's very um, specific to their process, and so it's designed for their process. So there's not an at large. Um, device, if you will, that can control ozone. It has to kind of be done at the source or on a vehicle itself. And so it's very source specific. Thank you. Jill. I just want to emphasize after working for decades in California, um, that once you start talking about how much it costs, you're kind of not going to get there. And I mean, I just, the cost is the health costs, the costs for economic development, the costs for not moving forward, for not having the quality or the, the beauty even of having a, a clear, you know, air. And we, even if you want to do the right thing, like we, we were trying to get our little Paradise Valley to buy an electric fire truck with Phoenix and it cost 50% more and it's the right thing to do. Our council actually wanted to do it, but they were concerned about the politics of you're spending taxpayer dollars to spend half a million dollars to buy an electric fire truck that had better technology and more more uh, equipment that could fight fires better in Paradise Valley. So one of the things I think we might 
want to look at is, are there incentives? Like there's regulatory things that work, but all of us, I think, naturally push back against regu regulations, especially government regulations. And if there were also similar to transportation plans of saying you submit to MAG a request for, you know, buying an electric vehicle that has X number, you know, fire trucks have a lot of emissions and they have cancer issues with firefighters because they stand there right next to the truck, right where the emissions come out. So there's cancer costs to that and they run during the whole event. So if there were similar to, you know, wanting to get funding for uh, a roadway improvement or a bike lane, do something like that with MAG that says there's X number of dollars from the federal government to do this. And um, we start competing and making it beneficial politically rather than it's going to cost too much. All right, Mr. Thank Chair, you. actually, yeah, yeah, one of the things that you approved the move forward to regional council starts getting towards that, which is to create a regional plan for carbon reduction that makes us eligible to apply for EPA grant funds for implementation of projects. So we're on we're on a path to that. It's not going to be quick, um, but but that is part of the part of the program. Okay, Mr. Chair, if I yeah, go just, ahead. Just, just one 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 last uh, comment to make is that. This is not the first time that Maricopa County has been in this type of situation. We were in this type of situation for particulate matter, uh, and we went through a process that now that at that point in time, it was led by Arizona DEQ, the state legislature was involved, and there were a series of stakeholder meetings where everyone uh, was what, from business community, from the regulated, from those, the regulators um, sat in a room for prolonged periods of time, over a prolonged period of time, and they they massaged that list of control measures that could be used to meet EPA's expectation that they we, that we reduce particulate matter emissions in Maricopa County by five percent. Um, that was an arduous process, but it was a process that that worked. Um, we were able to submit that plan to EPA. It was approved by EPA. Uh, and we were to, able to avoid a lot of the the really tough sanctions that that Tim mentioned. So, if we haven't already spoken to Arizona DEQ about their the possibility of their convening those types of discussions, we should do so. And if DEQ is not able or willing to do it, we need to find someone, some other organization. I don't know that it's MAG uh, because of the transportation emphasis, but it could be MAG or it could be Maricopa, Maricopa County, uh, but I, I strongly recommend that we have a, a coalition of um, a regulators, uh, associations of government like MAG, uh, the regulated community. The, I know the, the, the uh, Chamber of Commerce is interested in participating in this conversation, but we need to, as a community, get together and start and starts thinking about what our reasonable solutions are and what our tactics are and strategies are in approaching EPA about being more reasonable, about even giving credit for the, for the scenario that you just described. Getting credit credit for that scenario is very difficult, if not impossible, currently under the EPA regulations and their interpretation of their regulations. So it may seem like a great idea, but we may not get credit for that unless EPA takes a different approach or a different view of that type of scenario. So. We have a lot of work to do, and I think that we need to find an entity that's willing to take the lead in getting the right people in the room to have that conversation. And, and there's there's a history of, of doing this in the past, not that distant past, uh, for Maricopa County. At the risk of suggesting more process, it may be just hearing that worthwhile thinking about a small group of managers who want to have a working group. But I mean, Mr. Chair, maybe you're, not, you've, you're committed. You're already in on yours. But that may be something we do. Maybe we can talk that through. But I, I, I think there's yeah. something that I do happen to know very well, the DEQ director nominee, and I've talked to her a little bit, but I'll, I'll follow up on that. And and, and I, I know Karen as well. And I'd, be more, and I'd be more than happy to participate in, in that conversation because of the impacts that it has on our plans and Peoria for economic development. So I'm, I'm more than happy to participate. Good. Thank you. Any more comments? Whew. Tim, thank you. I'm sure we'll hear more from you later. Thank you. All right. Let us 
go to item number seven. It's an update on the public safety 911 committee efforts. Will be presented by MAG Information Technology Director Audrey Skidmore and MAG Policy and Government Relations Director Nathan Pryor. This is an information and discussion item. Thank you, Chair, members of the Management Committee. I just want to update you quickly on the process, progress of the consultant project for the 911 consultant. Um, they have largely completed the interviews. All the on site interviews are complete. We have a few people who are out sick or on vacation that we're trying to get um, through virtual interviews to finish that process. But we have um, largely moved on to the second phase. We've identified five peer agencies for review, um, and our advisory group has approved those. The consultant is working on those. Um, they have also begun the technology um, review as well. The, the timeline has been accelerated for this project. They've done that by combining the first two tasks, which were the interviews and assessment of the agencies and the technology review. So we will get the um, a combined report for those two. And you can see we're expecting to have that May 12th. And this process will allow us to get the final report uh, June 9th, which should allow it to go through our committee process in June. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, maybe I should share. Um, we had an opportunity, Kevin Felsnager, the chairs of the subcommittee on um, MR911, had an opportunity with Mr. Zerker and Audrey and Nathan to meet with representatives from ADOA and their CIO, was he CIO? Yeah. And members of their 911 uh, division. Um, they have new um, team members that are part of that now. And we had a very productive conversation um, about what has been said, what the, and talking about the vision going forward, the role of the state and where, what its priorities are, uh, kind of what its vision, and then talking about the, you know, the opportunity for MAG, for this region, this highly urban region, and what, what, how do those match up? And I think they were very supportive of the idea that MAG at least needs to continue to be together as a region. Um, we are working towards the conversation about the technology solution that they have procured. Our consultants are going to be engaging with them specifically. Is that right, Audrey? Our consultants met with them yesterday. Okay, perfect. So we're going to get that information. Um, but it's um, it's a good it was a good conversation that I think is going to help us find a solution that is not necessarily a, um, here's what we're gonna tell the state. It's gonna be, we're gonna go together with the state on this. I think we've got a very different communications um, approach that's coming from the state and how we're communicating with them that I think is be more productive. Kevin, you're, are you on still? Anything you wanna add? Uh, I am still on. Uh, just uh, as what I mentioned yesterday at the West Valley Mayors and Managers meeting as well, is that um, we're also looking at the governance part of the uh, MR911. So I think that's an important element of this. So both uh, we're looking at both technology and governance, it's kind of all on the table. And I would echo uh, Chair Brady's comments that I, I think we're, we're encouraged by the discussions that have been had thus far. Thank you, Kevin. Ed, anything else or Nathan, either one? Nathan? Any thoughts? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, just, uh, yes, conversations uh, feel like we're making headway with ADOA, kind of understanding uh, what their goals and vision are for statewide 911 and us too, kind of sharing uh, what we're doing, especially with the consultant report. Uh, ADOA, just like us, is waiting for the results of that report and see where we move together uh, after that report as a region, yeah. as a state, seeing value in the Maricopa region. Uh, continuing its work in 911, if if anything, for a, a level of redundancy, uh, which it came up as a consideration of concern, yeah. uh, both by the state and, and by our region. Uh, we will have ADOA staff at the tomorrow's public safety answering point managers meeting, as well as Monday's 911 study committee meeting, 
and then we'll have ongoing conversations as well. Uh, just a note too, our regular 911 processes continue. Uh, so we are starting our budgetary process now. Those are projects that we canvass the public safety answering managers for their projects, roll that up into our regional budget for submittal to uh, ADOA in the state. Uh, so I encourage you to check in with your PSAT managers in terms of where they're at and where they uh, think they need to be going for your respective jurisdiction. So I encourage you to have those conversations with your PSAT managers. And I would just tag on to that. Have conversations with your PSAT managers, but also maybe let's help, as Kevin was saying, the governance structure is going to have to change. Um, we are we're, we have a lot of chefs in the kitchen on this and a lot of perspectives. And I think if we can get the peace apps to appreciate there is a long game here, a process that's going through um, and the decisions and recommendations that are being made. I know there's a level of frustration at the peace apps level, but I think if they can just be patient, I think hopefully we'll be able to at least have an opportunity to provide some recommendations. So anyway, thank you. I, anything else? I think it was it, right? So that's all we have. Okay. Um, any questions or comments on that? All right. Let's go to number item number eight. Uh, is a discussion of the development of the MAG fiscal year 2024-2025 biannual unified planning work program and budget. Here to present MAG accounting is MAG accounting program manager, Amy Eppley. This item is on agenda for information discussion. Amy. Thank you, Chair and members of the MEG uh, Management Committee for letting me to present today on the fiscal year 24 and 25 bi biennial unified planning work program and budget. We have provided updates um, since January on the UPWAP. And um, this month we are presenting a, a revised draft of the member dues and assessments. The current changes include allocating the 911 special assessment of the 92,416, um, for which was for the independent review of the region assigned 11 system to include all member agencies. The only exception are those that were not part of the Maricopa 911 region of Florence, Maricopa, and Pinal County. Um, however, we did receive some updated information uh, since this was proposed. And Gilbert and Paradise Valley will be added to the fiscal year 24 assessment due to the timing of their transition. Um, also, uh, Meg is proposing staff salary increases. Um, we're recommending a proposed cost of living adjustment of 1.5% for fiscal year 24 and 25 for all staff in place as of July 1st. The COLA will be applied to interns, new hires, as well as staff who have recently received any promotions. The salary ranges for all positions will also be extended by the 1.5% accordingly to staff who are at their maximum um, to make sure that they receive that COLA as well. Um, and May continues to work on the final updated drafts of the UPWAP and our budget and brief document for recommended approval next month. That concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Amy, where did you get that 1.5%? Um, it was, thank you, uh, Chair and members of the MEG Management Committee. Due to the extension of the Proposition um, 400 unknown, um, the cost of living increase was just recommended by staff. Um, I don't know if Ed wants to comment on that any further. Yeah, we took a look at, you know, 5%, 3.5%, and, and given the uncertainty of the Prop 400 extension, at this point felt like one and a half percent kept us from falling behind too far, but also recognize sort of the uncertainty of the next year until we know where we're going. A half percent. I mean, if it, listen, I'm just speaking for Mesa, but we can't have Mag losing staff while we figure this out. Uh, one and a half percent. That's not cost of living. That's something, but it's not cost of living. Um, what, a half percent, yeah, what, Amy, what, in your head, what's the increment look like? What does each increment look like? Do you know what top of your head, what that looks like? Could you, maybe next time you come back, could you come back with, maybe it's just to give us a percent. What does a percent mean? And if that percent means, again, just speaking for myself, all my colleagues may not agree with this, then what would that mean as an increase in our assessments in order to keep MAG staff on until we work through Prop 400? 
So I just like to know what that looks like. Okay, for the next time. All right. Okay, yep. thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. No, I just want to say, Chair, I support your your direction there. I think getting more information would be helpful. Okay. All right. Let's do it. Thanks. All right. We'll go to item nine. Nathan, what do you got? Anything happening? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the management committee. Uh, I'll move through this uh, quickly. Uh, We've been focusing on really two bills at this point in the, our legislative efforts regarding the extension of the half cent sales tax for transportation, Prop 100 extension. Uh, 1246, we've reported on this before. Uh, this is the Representative Cook effort of notable on this slide is the transit allocation at 26%. Uh, in the regionally adopted plan, of course, that was at 40.4%. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, also in this bill, we see a number of provisions of concern, uh, prohibitions on sales tax and projects that result in reduction of lane miles, uh, adding two more TPC members. H however, there, there are positive construction conversations going on with Representative Cook. He continues to hold stakeholder meetings. We are very active in these conversations and even beyond Representative Cook, uh, additional opportunities to inform and educate members of the legislature. So we believe we're making a lot of positive headway in our efforts. Next slide, please. Uh, Senate Bill 1102, this one is uh, backed by Representative Livingston. It did pass out of House Appropriations on April 3rd. Uh, Mayor Weiss uh, continues to be very active. He did uh, take to the podium to voice concerns on behalf of MAG. Uh, some of these are the uh, more provisions of concern uh, related to housing, uh, these would be uh, provisions that would extend to our member agency regarding affordable housing, density zoning, others. Uh, so those are really non-starters for us. Mayor Weiss did a good job of communicating that. Uh, next slide, please. And then, of course, the, uh, the funding allocations much closer to our regional regionally adopted plan, notably transit at 39%. However, uh, would per, uh, to divert some of that funding uh, for low-income housing, land acquisition grants. That, of course, was voiced as concern as well. Uh, appreciate working with Representative Livingston, understanding he, he will, too, be holding uh, stakeholder meetings here very soon. We will participate in those. Um, next slide, please. And just a, a thanks to Governor Hobbs on Tuesday, April 4th. Uh, she did provide remarks at the 36th Annual Arizona Transfer, Transit Association Conference. Uh, really voicing clear support for MAG's legislative efforts and for continuing investment in transportation that continues to be investment in the region's economic opportunities. So thank you to Governor Hobbs for the, those statements at the ASTA conference. So conclusion, uh, making a lot of headway, informing a lot of members. Uh, we are optimistic at this moment in time that uh, we'll, 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 we will persevere in some manner, shape, or form. Uh, so a lot more conversations to be had, however, a lot of more information sharing to be done with members of the legislature. So uh, anything else? Okay. Any questions? All right. Very good. Thank you, Nathan. Are there any requests by management committee members for item on a future agenda? Uh, any uh, comments or announcements from the membership? All right. The next meeting of the MAG Management Committee will be May Wednesday, May 10th at noon. No 